so uh, a very warm welcome and good morning to all of you and all the panelists it's uh, indeed a pleasure as well as an honor to be moderating this session uh, cutting short the introduction part uh, we'll straight away for uh, proceed to the questions uh, just to give a brief background is that when we were discussing of uh, having this kind of uh, discussion this topic of uh, people with variant sexual orientations we felt that uh, we were of the view that we should just start uh, with only the basics part you know awareness let people know and all but while we were discussing with the panelist uh, it came up that the topic has al already reached to the masses and i think doctors are somewhere uh, still yet to catch up ca catch up with that and so we should start with not just awareness but acceptance and beyond so that's why we named this session as towards lgbt inclusion so with this back, brief background uh, I, i i first want to uh, ask a question to uh, mr khire sir good morning good morning yeah so sir uh, see you being the activist uh, i i i i think it it won't be an incorrect to say that you are kind of a first generation lgbtqi activist in india and yes uh, doctor so so being that you must have heard many different experiences of the people from the lgbt community which they had with the doctors so uh, on that background what do you think of uh, including today's topic uh, in the current cme uh, well first of all uh, on behalf of my lgbt iqa community i express my gratitude and thanks to the organizers of sexicon uh, because you see uh, the medical curriculum does not cover these issues although they are important it has always been considered that this is there are very few patient there are not many people who belong to this community so uh, and of course there are the prejudices and biases against these communities so it has this is a topic that has always been ignored the fact that you have taken the initiative without any prodding of the court or uh, any other uh, you know nmc at on your own you feel that medical practitioners need to be aware and be sensitized on these issues is a huge step and the correct signal that uh, goes out that it is high time that we started speaking of this subject which is primarily uh, medical in nature so because i have received a lot of negative feedback and i personally have experienced a lot of homophobia and transphobia in the medical profession especially ignorance uh, i do feel that uh, the, this generation needs to know about this because we see that the nmc is working on changing the syllabus so the next generation probably will have be uh, taught this and they will have a disc a lot of discussion on this in the medical colleges but for this generation we will have to rely on cmes to reach out to medical practitioners so yes the, i am thankful to you for this session as well as yesterday's outstanding session on gender dysphoria so thank you thanks a lot sir and indeed it is uh, we also as a psychiatrist also we felt that uh, this topic should be taken up uh, proactively rather than being no uh done only in a reaction form after some legislation has been passed i think we should take it like that so Absolutely. indeed it's a whether to large uh, uncovered undiscovered uh, spectrum of human sexuality still there uh so can you just briefly explain i mean uh, i remember when i did my first year uh, residency it was only lgbt and then as i passed out and today it is like lgbtqia plus n and the terms are increasing it's ever growing acronym so can you just uh, elaborate on that a bit so that maybe yes. maybe many of us don't know about it yes uh, the terminology can be a bit confusing as well as the fact that it is evolving every day because this is a relatively new field so we will expect more uh, terminologies in the coming days so to keep things simple we divide our sexuality into three dimensions the first it's like for plotting a point on a three dimensional axis the x axis y axis and z axis the x axis is your anatomy what we call as phenotype or genotype whether you be have genitals and the reproductive organs and the sex chromosome composition of a male or whether we have it as a female so generally we have always assumed that it will be a binary the baby will be born as only with male genitalia male sex chromosomes or female genitalia and female sex chromosomes that is not always true and what we see is that there is a spectrum in between where some babies could be born with ambiguous genitalia 
the word that is used in medical textbooks is generally hermaphrodite or pseudo hermaphrodite but that from the rights point of view is not the correct term we use we the correct term we use is either sex so any person who has ambiguous genitals uh, presentation of uh, genitals reproductive systems either internal or external is an intersex person and this is a range so there's not just one type of intersex person based on various causes like whether it's androgen insensitivity syndrome or congenital adrenal hyperplasia or various other uh, uh, presentations or uh, def- uh, we will have different types of presentation different kinds of presentation and they could be so minor as to be totally undetectable even to the person or so major that it is obvious to everyone so there is this huge range so the x axis on one end will have male the other end will have female and there are infinite combinations in between where you could have a combination of this generally dr leonard sachs predicts that approximately less than two people in 10000 will have some extent of amb- ambiguous uh, presentation so this x axis the y axis is your gender identity it is generally assumed that if you have a body uh, anatomy of a male you are obviously going to have gender uh, expression and gender recognition as a male if you are anatomically female you are bound to have your gender identity or recognition as a female so there is a congruency between anatomy and your gender which is called this is called as cis gender cis cis gender but that again is not always true what we see is that there are some people who have a gender other than the gender that we, they have been assigned at birth so we will have baby boys who will have a gender which is other than male so their anatomy is male but their gender identity does not match with their male gender for those whose gender is the opposite of your their anatomy for example biological sex is male but their gender identification is female we or biological female but their gender sir, identification is male sir, sir sorry to sports. sorry to interrupt but can you just uh, uh, keep your responses brief because we have uh, to cover okay. so many topics okay. uh, so we have trans persons here so we have transgenders pan genders who have multiple genders and a genders who do not identify with any gender and the third dimension is sexual orientation where whom you are sexually emotionally attracted to whether you are attracted to men only women only both or none so each person sexuality and gender is like a three dimensional uh, plot on a three dimensional axis so lgbtiqa is basically a representation of that point plot l for lesbian g for gay b for bisexual t for transgenders i for intersex a for asexual and those who are yet identified so this in summary all of these are natural ways of sexuality and gender none of them are disorders thank you thank you i think we can just sum up what sara said is that uh, what we usually have in mind is a biological male should behave should behave like a male should dress like a male should identify himself as a male should get attracted towards females should have sex with females and should be identified as heterosexual i think at each of these steps there are variations uh, possible uh, somewhere in between people can lie and all of these uh, terminologies represent that uh, very thank you sir we we move to a second part of the discussion uh, the, the 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 part which we have named it as understanding expressions and perceptions in developing years i would like to rope in dr shukla sir here so sir we heard yesterday a brief in brief that development of sexuality and its components starts right from the conception with the sex chromosomes and all and then there are many other biological and environmental factors uh, playing their role so uh, we would like to understand from you what are the difficulties faced in these growing years from the people of uh, alternative sexual orientations or other variant sexual orientations like are there any developmental issues different how do we handle the parents and all so so uh, abhijit the real difficulty that we face as practicing doctors right now is that we all assume that sexuality or anything related to sexuality starts around adolescence but what we know very clearly from research so far is that most likely 
gender identity and even orientation is determined in utero what we do not know is that is this a complete 100% truth or there are any variations are there any changes or important issues that arise after birth are part of development science is still not 100% sure about this so typically what happens is that people who have more extreme distress with their orientation or with their gender identity invariably will show distress very early on so you can even have I, i'm not talking about intersex here where you will see certain anatomical hormonal or clear differences i'm talking about people's her own perception so you can have a child as young as 3 years old or a 4 year old child who can say that uh, say for example their biological sex is female but their gender identity is male they can say that i don't want to be called by this name i don't want to wear these clothes and they will show very clear traditional male patterns there as well and this can lead to lot of distress in the family this can continue all the way through even during adolescence when people become more aware of their orientation about their sexual preferences they may realize that they are different from the majority and this is where the real difficulty is our current understanding or a prevalent belief is that majority is normal and everything that is minority is abnormal which is where science and practice has been going wrong so far now we know that these variations exist they are natural variations like the colors of our eyes and anybody who is different as we know in society will face difficulties growing up so if they disclose it so there is a big distress in their own mind do i fit in do i change what should i do when it is exposed to other people their reactions will vary quite dramatically when they try to become sexually active that will add another layer of complexities there so growing up as a person of minority sexual orientation or any minority sexuality there is definitely a very distressing part for almost all children i haven't come across any child so far who early on realized that they were different and were perfectly fine with it the journey is always tortures for the minority part there yeah. that that's uh, like something the, the information what you shared was like as early as age of 3 and 4 uh, those who are very clear about their identity as well as sexuality but uh, they can express in their behaviors and uh, um, yes indeed it will be a very uh, troublesome journey for them all throughout so growing from childhood when we come to adolescence uh, some of things like we know adolescent as you said correctly that it is the emphasis about uh, adolescence and the sexuality part cannot be over emphasized uh but then in in this this age group as, as especially how do we uh, like how are they different from their heterosexual counterparts uh and some uh, very important uh, confusion that we practicing uh, clinicians have is how to differentiate between uh, sexual experimentation which is a common thing in this age and sexual orientation because many times they do experiment with same sex as well Uh, so uh, abhijit here we will be digressing a little bit from our traditional medical path traditional medicine and our medical training forces us to come to a firm diagnosis as quickly as possible you know a doctor cannot imagine passing their final mbbs exam or their long case without being able to give a diagnosis so everything needs to be concrete there typically what happens in alternative sexualities is that these are evolving patterns we know from study of human sexuality that people's orientation their identity and their sexual preferences can actually evolve over a lifetime hmm. so it is it is important to resist the urge to give a diagnosis or to put a label or try and put people in categories when an adolescent or even a young child comes and talks to you about these things it is better to explore sexuality reassure them that whatever they are feeling is a natural variation and see how it evolves our role there is essentially to reduce their distress and make sure that they grow up safely if they are trying to experiment they are being careful with it they are aware of the legal situation they are aware of the dangers that are involved in early sexuality and that should be our primary job as practicing doctors 
to reduce distress and to assure safety being in a hurry to label them to put them in a category to discuss that with their parents immediately are all things which will keep on evolving and early the earlier you intervene there there is a higher chance that you are actually making a wrong diagnosis if you can call it diagnosis at all because now we know that it doesn't need to be called a diagnosis because diagnosis is only for an illness or a disease not for a variation so then what do we tell to their parents because their anxiety their restlessness is quite high and how to how do we address that so it educate- can happen in anyone's clinic any family physicians clinic or in pediatricians the first person to be approached is not a psychiatrist they will go to the other doctor so how do we do so i think yeah i think the first job for that doctor is to reassure the family that you are looking at one snapshot of a 3 hour long movie so don't panic don't jump out of your skin just yet let us wait let us see how all of this evolves and let's make sure that our relationship with the child or the adolescent is intact because if they run into any trouble they should come back to us to get help and then actually get a proper psychological assessment or a consultation done with a person who is more knowledgeable in that area but reassuring the family is very important second part where family uh, physicians are really crucial is as a trustworthy person of the family hmm. because once the person is see we will need a coordination between a family doctor and the psychiatrist the psychologist or endocrinologist whoever is involved there because family will always go back to their family doctor and ask kya doctor ne asa asa sangitla ahe ata yacha kay karu so a good communication is really important de emphasizing need for immediate diagnosis is definitely important and reducing stress for the family is the next important step there thanks very much sir i think the most important part here about sir of said is that as as parent we should tell them that keeping the relation from parent to son or parent child is more important so that the child comes back and talk to talks to us uh, instead of uh, ridiculing him or no taking him to different doctors and trying to change as initially used to right right handed left handed to be changed to right handed now it is not i think that should not be uh, done in a very haste uh, the, uh, thanks sir so we will now proceed to the next part of our panel discussion the the the, the parts name what we have done is its roles to play within the clinical dimension so as a doctor we have different kind of roles so that is one of the uh, uh, thing it's not just being a medical practitioner but we play different roles so uh, i want to rope in dr jyoti ma'am Uh, about this next part uh, ma'am in our routine clinical practice uh, we may come across some who are you know kind of confused or scared about their orientation and their presentation to us uh, may be actually related to this particular thing about their sexuality and uh, as i as we discussed it can be anyone it can be a, a pediatrician it can be family physician whom they will first go to so are there any specific clinical presentations for entities which are related to sexuality orientation and how we can manage it at the primary care level uh, yeah thank you thank you uh, dr bijit and the organizers of this con- uh, conference for inviting me uh, to carry on from where dr bhushan uh, left off i think uh, when we are talking about children and adolescents who are questioning it is very important that they seek help i mean for the from the general practitioners where the obviously the primary role of the general practitioner is reassuring both the child adolescent and the parents and the family involved questioning is something that is there in most children in with regards to uh, orientation it is something that you know may crystallize with something very specific but apart from that we also see a lot of children who go through stress exams in fact i think you know now we are in the middle of board exams for example so any sort of stress that is there can actually precipitate a lot of anxiety and stress related disorders depression anxiety sometimes in the vulnerable probably even a psychotic breakdown and sexually related themes whether related to orientation whether related to identity could also be a factor here i would say as a practitioner as a family practitioner it is important to assess how distressed the individual is whether the person needs another referral to a specialist a mental health professional like a psychiatrist to actually decipher whether there is any need because as you said rightly the clinical dimensions sexual orientation now we don't we see it as a variation but the thing is there could be disorders like psychosis like example schizophrenia or any sort of you know psychotic depression for example where you could get certain themes 
which could be something that is very confusing. In fact, it is very important even for psychiatrists, even mental health professionals to actually assess and clarify for themselves. And this may happen over several sessions also, whether this is actually something related to gender dysphoria, for example, or is it a psychotic process that is happening? And uh, before you actually diagnose the child or the adolescent to having uh, gender dysphoria. And this, I'm talking from experience because we have had cases where uh, we have been unsure and we have had to do repeated assessments, probably confer with our colleagues. In fact, we do a lot of uh, uh, cross consultations with our own uh, friends and colleagues to actually get to the root of the problem because there are lots of psychiatric disorders, as I said, majority of course being the psychotic spectrum disorders. And of course, even in depression and anxiety, there could be certain uh, obsessive thoughts that come with regards to sexual orientation or sexuality that could be part of an obsessive uh, compulsive disorder spectrum and not necessarily related to orientation or sexuality per se. So and it is important the, to, obviously to assess. Yeah, ma'am, something in the adult side, no, this is about adolescence that we have discussed. Yeah, even for like, adults, I mean, even for adults, I would say that even for adults, it is important because uh, when we are actually having a psychiatric disorder and for example, for example, if you have a person who identifies as a trans person, uh, here, you know, when you talk about differential diagnosis, you have to see whether the cross-dressing is part of a fetishism, whether it is a transvestitic fetishism that is there, whether it is, and there it is not something that needs to be addressed with uh, any sort of, uh, you know, gender affirmation intervention at all. You need to sit and look at what is the uh, root cause of the uh, cross-dressing, for example. So this is something that requires a little more specialist assessment. So I would say like when a, you know, when a general practitioner, for example, comes across some, something like this, it needs to be referred for assessment. Ma'am, uh, uh, as you said that uh, these uh, uh, sometimes can be obsession part of an OCD or uh, other things, but uh, we have heard no people like uh, coming across or coming, coming out quite late in their life, like 30s and 40s and or even, uh, even younger ages when the first time that senses come, uh, of having a sexual feeling towards a same sex person, things like uh, homosexual panic, which can often present at casualties also in emergency departments. So how do we uh, deal with that? Because uh, many a times psychiatrists may not be available there. Yeah. So if it is something like in the context of a clinical psychiatric syndrome, that there is a lot of anxiety or even a psychotic breakdown, I think even in an emergency, you know, probably managing the emergency as something like a psychiatric a psychiatric emergency with anxiety or even a psychotic breakdown in the emergency is usually done. And it's not necessarily done only by psychiatrists, you know, having anxiolytics on hand, having some parental, uh, you know, medication on hand can reduce acute anxiety. But apart from that, even reassuring the individual when, uh, you know, you don't have any medication and you just need to sit down with the individual and get him to at least ventilate what a stress has been is something that can be done and that requires time. Thanks very much, ma'am, about that. Uh, ma'am, uh, this was about people who are confused or haven't, you know, completely uh, accepted their orientation. But then uh, there have been incidences where a person openly accepts that he is gay or he, is, uh, he she is lesbian. And when such people come to as a, as a clinician, how clinician, without, because of his own uh, you know, belief system and how that can have a difficulty uh, with, with you know, dealing with the patient. Uh, I would also like to uh, add a sub-question to it. Sometimes clinicians themselves are unsure about their own sexuality. So can that also interfere with you know, this doctor-patient relationship? Okay. Uh, I think a, a lot was addressed with regards to you know, prejudices that a medical professional could have with regards to you know, orientation and gender identity uh, on one aspect and the other being their own personal uh, you know, uh, feelings, or orientation or questioning regarding their orientation that could be actually uh, mixing up or confusing them in re with regards to the doctor-patient relationship. So when it is about, you know, I would assume that when you know person has finished his graduation, for example, I know there is some clarity with regards to this. It could be that they have some clarity personally, but uh, they have not been able to accept it or they're not actually, you know, it is something that is there in the background. 
obviously it will impact their doctor patient relationship in terms of you know how they go about it intervening uh, it's not only about sexual orientation i think our prejudices or our own perceptions and experiences impact everyday life in terms of uh, our relationship with our patients it could be related to any crisis it could be any uh, related to any grief loss so that is something that you know it's uh, we are humans first and doctors afterwards so then that is something that will impact us anyway sexuality is just one aspect of it so what i would say is that what is required is in fact i think uh, this is something that we need to do probably have much more clinical forums where this can be discussed apart from that i think even uh, general practitioners for example when they have small peer groups discussing and actually having some sort of peer discussion with relates re, which is related to these problems which arise which may impact management of their patient and clinical population is something that can be you know probably uh, done and this can be done in small groups with someone probably you know moderating the discussion because that is something that helps and i think that is something that helps us uh, i am speaking as a psychiatrist we have group therapy you know or individual therapy supervisions from mentors and seniors and we also have discussions amongst our own peers so i think this is something that can be done even uh, for general practitioners Uh, thanks a lot i think this uh, group discussion part is very important so uh, let's not just this one session be the only session but frequent such sessions are at a smaller scale can be held uh, among different associations we have family physician associations we have pediatricians associations and in small small groups so that uh, these topics can be discussed and um, we can uh, prepare ourselves equip ourselves to deal uh, and to handle the um, uh, people from the community well Uh, thanks very much ma'am uh, with this now we will move to the part 4 of our discussion panel discussion uh, which is roles to play outside clinical dimension so now we have seen roles we we can play as a clinician but outside clinical dimension also we have different roles to play we are not just doctors we are also family members and when coming to our own family sometimes it happens that we may use different standards than we use in the clinical uh, setting uh, what if tomorrow one of my own family member be it an immediate one or a distant one Uh, comes out or is struggling with his sexuality uh, i would like to rope in dr arvin sir to answer this question sir please how do we what are the yes. ways we support them and as a family member not as a clinician because there's some yes. different emotional connect that we have and uh, yes uh, certainly your pressure also we yeah sir yes thank you abhijit thanks a lot and thank you for this forum too and uh, i think what jyoti said is we are humans first and doctors later so so far what we have seen is there seems to be a lot of confusion misunderstanding in everyone's mind it's not only the patients who or sorry not patients it's not only the persons but the clinicians as well who are very confused about what's happening and what's being reported so it's not surprising that whenever a family member a friend or someone who's close to us comes and tells us about what they are going through in terms of their orientation or identity and it is very confusing what tends to happen is whenever someone comes out or uh, reports it to the near ones there is a lot of marginalization and there is a lot of social isolation सगळ्यात पहिली रिॲक्शन अशी असते की हे असं काही नाहीच आहे हे तुझ्या मनाचेच खेळ आहेत सगळे आणि आमच्या घरात आमच्या कुटुंबात आमच्या खानदानात अशा गोष्टी होऊच शकत नाही सो फर्स्ट थिंग द फॅमिली ऑर इव्हन द सोसायटी द लिमिटेड सेन्स दे विल डू इज दे ट्राय अँड आयसोलेट सच अन इंडिव्हिज्युअल इफ अन इंडिव्हिज्युअल इज ब्रेव्ह इनफ अँड स्टँड हिज ओन ग्राउंड देर विल बी मार्जिनलायझेशन आम्ही आणि तू हा डिफरन्स तिथेच लगेचच सुरू होतो त्याच्यातून काय होत की देर आर इश्यूज अबाउट स्कूलिंग देर इज होमलेसनेस बिकॉज मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम्स वी हॅव सीन दॅट सच अन इंडिव्हिज्युअल इज आस्क टू लिव्ह द हाऊस इफ दे कम आउट वाईल दे आर वर्किंग देर आर जॉब लॉसेस द सपोर्ट सिस्टम सीम्स टू बी क्रम्बलिंग नॉट ओनली इट हॅपन्स ऑन द फॅमिली लेवल it also happens on a more wider level where a person comes in conflict with either the family system or the social systems and also suffer a lot of rejection 
out in the open world there is homophobia made be based on the moral grounds the religious grounds or even political grounds so very snide comments jokes aimed at a different person uh negative portrayals in the common media are also very common so when we are dealing with a person who is different from others we need to understand that all this is likely to happen and whatever is likely to happen will happen and will affect them so rather than being a doctor first i would first say that be as a human being be very supportive when someone close to you discloses something try and understand them on a different level because not only a family member but you are also wearing a hat as a doctor and a doctor who by default most of the times is respected within the family so asha vyaktila samjun ghena ani aadhar dena at the first disclosure is very important so he vaila hava ani hota khup sha pramanat but we need to do this thanks a lot so i think this uh, last part was most important part that we should first try to understand and support the person yeah. rather than you no know, uh, kind of make comments or ridicule or subject him or be a party to the subject uh, party to the others uh, behavior towards him yeah. it is discriminatory yeah. uh, so we also carry a responsibility outside the clinic in a way that we bring up with the people of varied backgrounds we are called as chief guests at different fora in the schools and the colleges uh, so uh, as a as a knowledgeable and respected member of the society uh, how can we help this community of lgbtqi plus like this is the thing that we can go outside our usual clinical roles yeah i think what's happening now is we are changing a hat from a family member and a doctor to a doctor a knowledgeable one within the wider community the society again as a doctor what we need to know is because of all that a person from the community may undergo or may suffer there will be and trust my words there will be a lot of distress and that distress will manifest in terms of low mood even syndromal depression lot of stigma around being different again a lot of harassment there could be self harm there could be anxiety there will be substance abuse there will be suicidal ideation and even attempts what's important to remember is a person from the community is at least eight times more likely to have attempted suicide is about six times more likely to have depression than the normal uh, community three times more likely to have used or abused substances so as a knowledgeable member of the community when we go as you mentioned as funk at, at functions or even socially as doctors it is important that if we come across a person who is from the lgbt community he may be having certain issues which a person does not want to talk about so again the important part is being able to recognize the distress and being in the supportive role for the individual and as we said that uh, as we looked at in the last uh, answer to the question that if we find that the society is somehow either marginalizing or stigmatizing an individual we need to stand up for them not in a very obvious way because people don't often need help and support what they need is an ally in a social situation so being a friend and being a friend who's also a doctor definitely helps in social situations so again the take home message is the same that we need to be understanding and supportive and being a doctor makes us even more responsible to look at this and do this so thanks a lot about yeah. about that sir so anything specific about you no know, attitudinal change that we can try bringing in a society like including at least the three or four lines on this part when we are talking about in general some health and somewhere like that can that help or how oh. that that definitely that definitely helps because that that we can look at it at two ways one is it has to come from the system down 
and the second is it comes from the individual with the new nmc and very knowledgeable people like bindu madhav khire who are actively working in this field we are looking at bringing out an attitudinal change from top down also bindu is doing a lot of work from uh, the community level as well but again as a member of a doctor member of a community being aware being uh, accepting even though you may not like being accepting non stigmatizing uh, the condition definitely helps in bringing out that attitudinal change ekhadi gosht jo paryanta apan manya karat nahi to paryanta ti accept karat nahi त्यामुळे मला ही गोष्ट मान्य आहे नाही बाजूला ठेवूया असं काहीतरी असतं हे चुकीचं नाहीये आणि हे चुकीचं नाहीये हे कोणीतरी ज्याला या गोष्टीतलं कळतं असा माणूस सांगतोय त्यामुळे हे बरोबर नसलं तरी हे चूक नक्की नाहीये एवढ्या लेवलला जरी आपल्या आजूबाजूची लोक आली तरी तो ऍक्सेप्टन्स अजून वाढू शकेल व्हेरी इम्पॉर्टंट राईट लाईक Uh, agreeing may not be necessarily that we should yeah. agree that uh, okay it's, it is okay if it like uh, even i believe in that that may not be there but at least this is current scientific uh, situation and scenario and we should uh, say in those words uh, kind of trying to bring attitudinal change whenever we okay. go out at yeah. the social forum thanks yeah. a lot sir with this we'll uh, now move to the last part of a panel discussion and right now what sir said is that there have been certain there have to be certain changes which come from top to down top to bottom uh, some systematic changes some change in the system so this part of part 5 of our discussion is assuring changes in the system towards lgbt inclusion uh, so i would like to come to dr bushan sir again this time uh, sir you have been to going to schools holding holding different kind of workshops and uh, giving talks about uh, um, in general in general uh, mental health as well as sexuality also uh, how can we sensitize the management of the school are there any such changes already taking place uh, or can we just give them some reference that see this is school is doing like that we can just follow something like that so bushan uh, sir abhijit unfortunately uh, what we see in society is reflected in schools in a more concentrated way uh the way it works is that school management has specific targets and specific desires the actual people who run the school like the school principal and the teachers may have a different orientation and students may live on a third planet altogether many times getting all these three together is really important may, uh, my, what i have seen so far again and again while working with schools is that school and the school management is first and foremost worried about their reputation their thing is that we do not want any trouble we don't want to be known as the school who has this issue mm. and that becomes a big problem unless there is some difficulty that turns up in the school a child either self harms in a big way or some crisis happens usually we do not see schools opening up to even this discussion there are always pressures from parent lobbies who will say that how dare you talk these things with children why don't you focus on science and maths that is what is more important so a long term relationship with school is what i aim to develop that we work on mental health issues we work on issues that are most important for them and sexuality obviously comes up so the way i try to deal with it is that is to ha- let the school have a comprehensive sex education program and while they are discussing sexuality while they are discussing awareness while they are discussing difficulties create a forum where children can freely discuss their own concerns without being identified and as such times the issue can come up and educative work can happen with schools as well as with teachers so indirect way by way of education is usually the way i try to go about it because that becomes more acceptable when we are talking to children again law poses lot of difficulties for us what you can talk to children what is prohibited what will be directly considered under uh, as an offense under poxo these are all various levels that operate there so keeping the education theme intact which is the most important thing in school is usually the way to go about it 
Yeah, so it seems that under the umbrella of sex education, comprehensive sex education, we can definitely include this topic. Uh, I, but I think a few years back, maybe 10, 20 years down the line, uh, before, um, the, the inclusion of topic of sex education in the schools was also very much debatable and people were not very open to. But now they have been there. They do call doctors into that. Maybe a few years down the line, they will also focus on this particular area. But certainly many, system, many changes are yet to be happening there in, uh, in schools. But uh, recently, we have seen some changes happening in the uh, medical education system as well, or at least uh, the, it has been initiated. And uh, we are currently we are very we 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 want we would like to congratulate people here on the panel, uh, Bhushan Shukla sir, Jyoti Shetty ma'am, and Bindu sir. All three of us, I think, Arvind sir also played a part in it. So they have been a part of the um, panel who uh, reported to the National Medical Commission. Uh, so to highlight on this particular thing, and this is the same thing about how to bring about changes in the system of medical education, like we have, uh, uh, like we can, no? uh, preparing our next generation doctors for this. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Jyoti Shetty, ma'am, so, ma'am, what are these changes? What what was the news recently? We were very we were very happy as well as proud of all you of all of you, ma'am. Yeah, I would just uh, make a correction. It is uh, Dr. Bhushan Shukla and Bindu Madhav Pire. Who were and not me in, too. <laughs> yeah, who were instrumental in actually it is their work and uh, what they have written, which helped in uh, the report that NMC, that the National Medical Council uh, Commission, prepared for the Madras High Court uh, proceedings. Uh, this is with regards to changes in the forensic medicine uh, textbooks curriculum and also for the UG and PG training uh, in psychiatry. So just to go back a little bit, I think there have been a lot of uh, changes right from the IPS, that is the Indian Psychiatric Society position statement, the repeal of uh, 377, again, Mr. Kire has been instrumental in that area, uh, to uh, actually what came out even uh, two years ago in terms of the IPS position on conversion treatment, that is, you know, uh, treatments which are directed to changing a homosexual orientation to a heterosexual one. These are things that have been happening on the sidelines. Apart from that, last year, the Madras High Court had inquired and required the NMC to actually bring about changes in the curriculum. Now, what we have in the undergrad uh, curriculum is a competency-based medical education curriculum. So obviously, we have to move with the times as educators also to bring about a new generation of doctors who are LGBTQ sensitive. Since it's a variation, so the changes that have been coming up would be in forensic medicine textbooks, which have been really old. So then the pamphlet that has come out from the NMC is both for the virginity test and for the LGBTQ sensitization. So it is based, it has just been uh, declared, I think, about a week ago, about 17th of uh, February. Uh, so the UG curriculum will involve changes in the forensic medication, uh, medicine uh, education for undergrads with regards to terminology, sexuality, LGBTQ orientation. Uh, this is, will be done with integration with uh, the psychiatric, uh, you know, the teachers also. The postgraduate education will be about, you know, bringing about sensitivity to not only about the LGBT community, but also the psychological mental health issues faced by the community and how to deal with them. And obviously, enforcing and, uh, you know, seeing that, you know, it is enforced, that conversion therapy is not something that needs to be, has to be practiced uh, to bring about any change because, uh, you know, the LGBTQ, you know, the initialism stands for a variation in sexuality. So these are the changes that have been there and we are very much part of, you know, as medical teachers, we have to all be part of that. Hopefully we'll see uh, some amount of uh, sensitization uh, even from the, children to the parents upwards because what I have seen as a medical teacher is that the youth are pretty much more familiar, much more open and more sensitive, unlike the adults who are teaching them. So we have seen like in the past four years, Mr. Kire has been coming to our college and taking sessions. It's actually the medical teachers who seem to be a little clueless, even about the terminologies and even about the basics in, you know, sort of sexuality, gender identity, and orientation. So I think we yeah. have a lot of learning to do. Yeah, certainly, ma'am. Uh, that, that day I was discussing with Bhushan Shukla sir also that he said that uh, someone, some child uh, in a remote area, maybe Nifat, Satana, anywhere, 
where there's a net connection available and if he has any problems you just google it and then the site which opens is nhs uk uh, so so i think definitely maybe as a medical teachers have a lot of thing to learn uh, so uh, for, for this is a, and we yes we were certainly discussing about this uh, cbme competencies for all of those who are in medical colleges then we were preparing timetables for this uh and we were discussing about the points and i was like uh, i was discussing with my hod here that how come these questions are still being posed to the medical students these are against like sodomy and so many other things were there in that uh um, it was very i think it is very uh, welcome and very uh, proactive step progressive step towards lgbt inclusion uh i would like to ask next question to uh, arvind sir uh sir uh, so we have the seen about what we can do uh, uh, in the school system what we can do in a medical college system uh, we doctors also run hospitals we are entrepreneurs yesterday yeah. we had a chat uh, we had a talk by dr gupte or uh, dr apte sir on the same uh, we we run we uh, work at different managerial positions administrative positions so being at that position how we can you know make the environment work environment uh, more safer and more inclusive for these people i hear some of the big companies especially it companies uh, they say that we have lgbt friendly policies and in fact they flaunt about it so that they can get more and more people from the community to work so how Correct. does it yeah. help and how can, can we do in our hospitals uh basically how we can do it in our hospital if as you said we are uh either the proprietors the owners or on the managing board of a particular hospital first of all we need to be convinced about what we are talking bhakta kai tari niyam ala ki va csr cha khali paise milnare et manun he karaiche it's not going to work so we need to be convinced first that what we are dealing with the lgbt community is not an issue but as a resource and they have every right to work in whatever environment that they want and when we accept ki it's their right to find employment in whatever field whatever environment they need it becomes our responsibility as doctors to provide them with a suitable environment where they will not feel marginalized where they'll not feel threatened where they'll feel accepted सो पहिल्यांदा आपण हे मानूया की मला हे करायचंय मला हे मान्य आहे अँड देन इट कम्स टू ट्रेनिंग द स्टाफ दॅट वर्क विथ यू बिकॉज येस यू मे बी मोटिवेटेड यू मे बी फाईन विथ अ कम्युनिटी पीपल पर्सन वर्किंग विथ यू बट अल्टिमेटली दे बी वर्किंग विथ द पीपल हू वर्क विथ यू सो फक्त आपण कन्व्हिन्स असून उपयोग नाही आपल्या बरोबरच्या सगळ्या लोकांना पण त्याच्याबद्दलचं शिक्षण द्यायला पाहिजे सो वॉट वी नीड इज ट्रेनिंग सेशन सेमिनार्स वर्कशॉप सेन्सिटायझेशन फॉर पीपल हु आर वर्किंग विथ यू इट्स नॉट ऑफन दॅट जस्ट दॅट हेल्प बिकॉज अ पर्सन अ कम्युनिटी पर्सन फ्रॉम द कम्युनिटी नीड्स टू फील कम्फर्टेबल नीड्स टू फील हर्ड when he comes to a hospital or a setting we are all so geared up to the medical model and sort of this heterosexual world we tend to oversee or not see specific terminologies that the lgbt community person will use and trust me the certain terms that people use tend to evoke a very bad response from even our colleagues mm-hmm. and that immediately is a put off for a person who's trying to access help so apan jeva manto ki ami lgbt friendly vatavaran taiyar karto hai pan jar amhala aiku aikunas ghaycha nahi hai kiwa kalunas ghaycha nahi hai ki tyanche issues ka hai so fakt sexuality orientation gender he shabd shikun ते संभाषणामध्ये वापरून होणार नाहीये वी ऑल्सो नीड टू मेक शुअर दॅट अ पर्सन फील्स हर्ड अँड दॅट इज ऑल्सो इम्पॉर्टंट सो फर्स्ट थिंग इज वी नीड टू बी कन्व्हिन्स्ड अँड सेकंड इज वी नीड टू ट्रेन आर स्टाफ इवन दो इट इज अ क्लास फोर पर्सन हुज वर्किंग विथ यू और इवन युअर सिक्युरिटी गाय और करंट वर्ल्ड बाउन्सर्स हु आर वर्किंग ॲट द डोअर्स ऑफ द हॉस्पिटल 
to be respectful, to be knowledgeable, and to be proper when they are community, when they are communicating with a person from the community. So I think that is what we as a, pers a, a doctor in power or control or someone who has a say in the organization need to do. Yeah, that's that's very yeah. important that uh, first we have to be convinced by ourselves for that I want yeah. to run, I want to have such kind of environment and then train all the staff right from top to bottom till you are yeah. uh, attendant and uh, watchmen and everyone so that all of them are respecting towards the people. So any infrastructural changes like in, in Western countries there are like gender neutral washrooms and such things. Have you seen any such thing anywhere in India where you are aware of and how is it how much per is it practical in today's date personally i haven't seen them at least in hospitals i've seen air, airport restrooms or in big hotels hospitality industry yes but correct me if i'm wrong but hospitals ani ithe kuthes mala gender neutral washrooms or facilities disle nahi hai i think we are still a bit far away from providing physical infrastructure which is good for the lgbtq community i think it first needs to happen here yeah. and yeah. then it will be reflected in the physical infrastructure but mr kire can correct me if i'm wrong but uh, have have yeah. any one of us have noticed anything jyoti no. bhushan no i would say that you know in fact hospitals may not even agree because there's basically a restriction of space for you know basic yeah, things yeah exactly so uh, you know so having uh, you know like uh, unisex toilets you know non you know which is non binary sensitive and all even wards i think this is a discussion we had with mr kire and the director at our hospital and then i think it is a little difficult we try to accommodate in smaller rooms but uh, it's a little difficult in public spaces i mean and that is basically to do with the infrastructure apart from of course the mind space you know our own thinking and here i would just digress a little bit because you know we are not even disabled friendly uh, unfortunately yeah, exactly that is, yeah uh, that is uh, true of most of our institutions so you know uh, we have a long way to go yeah so it's indeed a long way to go but yes i think uh, such uh, a panel discussion should start that that at least the thinking balls rolling may not be the actual uh, things outside in the material uh, way uh, with this we'll come to the last part of the session the last question uh, to mr kire uh, bindu sir you there yeah yeah so we were speaking about changes in the school system changes in the medical education system changes in the hospital system what we can uh, uh, try to bring in or try to effect in but uh, i am sure now there are many changes already happened or happening in the legal system uh, right from uh, scratching of uh, section 377 and nalsa judgment and all so will you just like to uh, take us through all this changes which have been happening in legal system so that one thing is that uh, while we are taking a proactive role towards the community uh, we uh, can help them uh being being aware of these legal provisions at the same time we should be aware we should have some fear of law if we are landing or we are treating someone uh, in any discrimination out of knowledge or out of ignorance uh, we should also have that fear that uh, these legal actions can be uh, taken against us so yes uh, uh, before i answer this question just quickly let me state uh, two important things one is bharti hospital uh, uh, hod dr jyoti shetty and uh, dr arvind panchanadikar were instrumental in starting the first lgbti inclusive clinic in bharti hospital at the core unit level inclusion level and uh, km hospital pune is working on a systemic inclusion program so if anyone wants any detail or technical support on this i would be more than willing to help uh, uh, others out that was one thing i wanted to say now about legal system i will quickly say that mental health care act uh, 2017 section 182 makes it uh, discriminatory to uh, uh, discriminate against sex gender identity and sexual orientation so while providing medical services any kind of discrimination on the basis of these will be construed as discriminatory which means indirectly any kind of conversion therapy itself then become discriminatory according to the mental health care act whereas transgender persons rights act is concerned through the nalsa judgment every trans person has the right 
to decide whether they want their gender to be mentioned as male or female or transgender. Uh, initial, uh, so uh, initially the issue was the Indian Penal Code 320 uh, made it a crime of, uh, of serious injury, a list of serious injuries in which emasculation was one of the criteria. So the, some doctors used to be confused as to whether uh, sex, uh, gender affirmative surgery would be considered under IPC 320. But with the NALSA judgment, that concern has gone away. So you can legally diagnose someone as uh, with gender dysphoria and they can go in for transition without any legal, as long as the process is followed, they do not be worried on the legality of, of the, the transition. The bill also uh, provides the right to the collector, the trans persons or trans men, trans women can apply to the collector of their district. It's an online portal. And after submitting an affidavit, they can change their name as well as gender. If anyone wants any directions of how to go about it, we have done it for 10, 12 trans men in Pune and about 50, 55 transgenders in Pune. So I can technically help you out on that. So that has happening. What we are... Uh, Currently concerned about are only three main three issues. One is we want legalization of same-sex partnership, is either as civil unions or gay marriage. Secondly, the surrogacy act which has come in is regressive because it eliminates single persons and the entire LGBTIQA community from using it, uh, uh, going in for surrogacy. And uh, our, um, ART bill also is assisted reproductive technology bill also needs changes because it only talks of a commissioning couple and women. So it is very restrictive. So we are working on various fronts. So some are good things that are happening, but yes, legally there is a lot long way yet to go. Yeah, so, uh, so already there are a lot of legal changes which have been taking place. And uh, of course the community have different fronts to fight at. Uh, many issues are still yet to be answered uh, for inclusion. But uh, I think as a doctors, the first part of acceptance, we can certainly try our best. Uh, with such sessions and with such discussions, I think uh, this is just a start and initial uh, beginning kind of thing. And uh, what we have come across uh, towards all this discussion is, see, the wheels have already started rolling. And it's better to catch up with that Otherwise, we will get uh, stuck between uh, and get uh, some legal problems and 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 uh, be, become more regressive. So uh, I thank all for the panel, all the panelists for this wonderful discussion. It was wonderful interacting with you all. Also, being past uh, two weeks, we have been discussing on this topic, uh, and thanks organizers and, uh, that they gave us this chance to hold this kind of discussion in SexCon, and I think. Uh, all further conferences on sexology must include topic on uh, variant sexual orientations. They are not even alternative. They are not choices. They are just normal variations. So I think yes. I would like to stick to the yeah. term variant sexual orientations, that to normal variants of sexual orientations. Uh, thanks a lot. And I hand it over to our MOC, Dr. Smita Vakchari, ma'am. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Dr. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.